Okay, so this one is uh, catch up, obviously, but we're, this is now, now in the correct week. Okay, I'm glad to see, and hopefully we're going to go through this, cutting out some of the stuff so that we get back on time. Okay. Okay. This is really about. Um, get rid of all that because we've already done it. Right. So this is really about this. Okay. It's about efficient experience, and in the real world, people are going to call this usability. Okay. So. The term for everybody else, or for most of the people, until they all come to my way of thinking, <coughs> will eventually, is it's going to be called usability. Okay? So that's what you should be thinking about. Actually, it's about efficient design. Can we do something efficiently? Okay? That's the main aspect of this. And that's why this usability is always based on metrics, mainly. It's always based on things you can measure. It's very, very objective. Yeah, usability to all testing. Okay. Oops. Think of usability more in general terms, okay? The more general terms of efficient use, the concept of usability is much broader than the narrow kind of confines which are often associated with this usability metric. So efficient use might mean lots of things. For instance, is it efficient if it takes you five seconds longer, but you perceive it to take you five seconds less? Because you've been having a good time, or ten seconds less, or twenty seconds less. Is it efficient if you are if, it, if <coughs> you have a fun time doing things so you're happier? in your work, even though it might take you <coughs> 10 seconds more to perform the task? I don't know. I would say yes, it probably is more efficient because there's other benefits. Okay? But something that conventional usability is task time. Task completion time is what you're going to be measuring when you're doing usability for pretty much everything. It's all about task completion time mostly. Yeah? Okay. So. Let's go back to this, which you've all done, and we can have a quick ch chat about it. So, what did people think about the Xerox Park thing? Xerox <coughs> Park um, paper, and but actually the, the the system that came out of it. Yes. Yeah, the methodology is still in use. The methodology is still in use. Absolutely, it's used by lots, and actually, it's never, it's mostly never credited to Xerox Park at all. It's mostly like. Uh, some kind of expert who expert who's taken this along. Yeah. So people who are big in the field, like Ben Schneider, would say he have got his eight golden rules. You know, he's got thirty-two thousand citations on Google Scholar for his papers. Pretty good. Most cited human-computer interaction person on earth. Yeah. But Xerox Park, which did lots of the real empirical work. Yeah. That was really good stuff. Yeah. That's where it came from. Any other comments about it? Yes. It makes it like quite interesting. Predictions, like they said, soon all of the systems will be in big max displays, which we all know is not true. And they said um, about like two bucks max, and also predictions of decreasing costs of bandwidth. Yeah, the, yeah, that's right. De decreasing costs. They made lots of predictions that, be, that came that came true, obviously. And they were developing these systems um, at, from the alto for a long period of time before they actually rolled it out as a start. Anymore. Yes. Yeah, and looking at the uh, throwable codes as well, and uh, making sure that they're writing something to throw away rather than you know carrying it on and yeah. making the system sort of worse eventually. Yes, that's true. You know, we have a tendency with everything we write, and it's the same with I mean, you know, academics writing papers. We write these words and then they're ours, and we don't want to lose them, so we keep them, even though they're crap. Right? And it's the same with code. We keep the code even though it's crap because we've written it and it took us time. Yeah. Yes, yeah. I think the biggest thing from the paper was that the principle of designing the user interface before anything else. Yes, yes. So we've got lots of, lots of, I mean, these guys weren't natural user interface people. I mean, these were, some of them were, of course, but a lot of it was computer science, hardware. Most of these people have been trained in uh, engineering, maths, and some computer science at that time, and they got reasonably hard. There wasn't these, you know all-purpose computer science courses about. So, of course, for them to come to the point that humans are <coughs> going to be the first thing at the centre of the system, and these are engineers, that's a big that's a big thing for an engineer to talk about. Yes. And there's a record just saying that there, this is a new form of human engineering rather than human computer interaction. Yeah. Kind of yeah, human, uh, yeah. And the fact that they say 32 years to do this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. They need, yeah, yeah. It's fine as well that, um, to develop full circle design methodology. So they obviously initially developed this 
um, all that time ago. And then it's gone through the years, and the business has adopted like the waterfall model, and then going for different industry processes. And only just now, agile is coming in. And that's exactly what they were kind of emphasising back then. So that's true. That's true. And the other thing is that you know they were uh, a really uh, one of the first skunk works, if you like, because they were you know really at Xerox Park is where it's at. It still is actually. It's not Xerox <coughs> anymore, but it's, Xerox Park is is great for HCI, and, it, and that's what its reputation was all about. And it was very good at, at moving through the, um, these computer systems and these um, prototypes. You know, they ate, definitely ate their own dog food. Do we know what that means? No. Okay, well, it's in the notes. <laughs> but, yeah, yeah, they ate their own dog food, which means they used their own systems in, in anger, in reality. So, they, so the systems they built, they didn't just say, oh, shell it out. They, they used it in their offices. They built thousands of these autos before they actually stuck them out as a, as a, as a start. Just to get the iterations right, yeah. So the things that I'm taking from that, you, that we that we uh, integrate now into the principles of usability, uh, really, and, and, and effect, uh, efficient ex uh, efficient experience, are these. So this idea that I'm picking out anyway, this idea of familiar concepts. That what they that what they first decided was that we need to have familiar concepts. Okay. So those familiar concepts can run through lots of stuff that we're doing, lots of stuff. It doesn't have to be familiar concepts about the desktop or all this kind of stuff. It might be familiar job, job, familiar terms in an organisation or jargon that's used in an organisation. <coughs> universal commands. First time was proposed that we actually have universal commands for a sort of operating system that all the applications use. Shock. Yeah? I can remember in the 80s, God, I can remember in the 80s programming in Pascal and there was still no universal commands. Banged it out and invented the command as you liked. And you hoped that Borland um, you know, gave you a nice framework that you could work in that had these, uh, these universal commands in them. But they were universal commands for Borland, not for, uh, you know, Borland was the uh, development of the IDE at the time that generated the framework for it. Yeah. Um, consistency. Okay. However, there's a difference here. What, why why am I talking about this idea of pragmatic consistency from the paper? Why am I saying pragmatic consistency? Yes. Um, doing something that the user would not feel for self by occurring so that the example was if you move up to the front, so should the icon disappear and you've got other icons and should the back to where it came from? Yes, very true. So, so there's this consistency whereby it's not completely consistent. This is also this familiarity that is in there as well. Okay, so as we've just said, that if you're going to move uh, a document to the printer, would you want that document to then go because it's gone to the printer, or do you want it to go back to where it was? And that's different. Yeah. Okay. Um, simplicity, okay, but it's not a clinical principle. And user tailorability, so this is what they're talking about. How can we customise it to the user more? So all these principles here, which I think are key, are used today still. They were invented pretty much at this time. Okay. And this is empirically invented. They've actually done it. Also, um, I don't know if anybody's read any more around this work, but has anybody got, got any comments about the STAR operating system scroll bar? Okay. Any, anybody? So, scrolling on the STAR, they didn't know how it should work. Should the viewport move, or should the document move within the viewport? Okay. And so they did lots of empirical work and found out that actually it should be that the um, that the that when you when the scroll bar moves up and down, as in most systems today, you see the document move up and down. Yeah. But actually, in that, it's the viewport that, that people it, it's the control of the viewport that they think they think they're controlling your magnifying glass over the document. And that's not the case in say Windows, but it is the case. In, in the Mac iPad, uh, sorry, Mac iPads and iPhones. That's what you are doing now. The reason why it was changed, there's two different thoughts on this. The first one was that um, Steve Jobs went to look at this system and got it wrong. Or the other, th um, the other thing was that um, they did it so that they wouldn't have copyright issues, just like the slash backslash and forward slash for DOS and CPM. You know about the backslash and forward slash for DOS and CPM? No. So, C DOS is pretty much CPM, which was a, an original operating system that was, you know, well, not, 
well, appropriated in some way, whatever, and they just changed some of the actual ways that it worked, i.e. they changed forward slashes and back slashes around, so that all the systems used to have forward slashes between TPM, put a back slash around, and said, oh, it's not the same system. Yeah? Okay. So. Okay. So, how do we feel when, it, when we were, I mean, are, are we okay with this, with reading this document, with the star, uh, with the Xerox Mark document, with the byte article? Did you enjoy it? Was it good? Was it bad? Did it teach you anything that you didn't know? Did it teach you anything that you didn't know? Anybody who says, no, it taught me nothing, put your hand up. Did what told me? Things that happened, not things that don't you in the concepts. Okay. So things that happen, but it not, not conceptually. So you know, so the concept, these con oops, so those concepts you're already familiar with. Yeah, okay. Fair enough, good. Was everybody else familiar with these concepts? Yeah? Cool. <laughs> okay. Yes, you have to uh, I think one of the questions that came up in the familiar concept was they took, uh, when they're making a personal computer, they took it the commercial decision and saying, Taking the desktop as a, a work desk bench would be to bring it onto it, and and now we move away in the last forty years to sort of more personalized solutions to the home users rather than, but it's, yet we still use those same convention and terminologies as it would be a business computer. Yeah, uh, is there any sort of trend moving away from it, making no. it different? Yeah. No, it's very it's very static on Google's at the moment. The only stuff that I've seen that's any different is this idea of um, three dimensional GUIs. Uh, where, they, where you can see them in 3D desk, it's a 3D desktop, pretty much. Um, or there's, uh, there's ones whereby it's GUIs which still represent a desktop, but the filing system is generally stuff thrown onto the desktop in piles. Now, um, there's some stuff from the 90s, 80s and 90s, um, mainly put out by um, a guy called Frank Chipman at Texas A&M, um, and that was all to do with spatial hyperlink. So, hypermeet, so this was ways of displaying um, information, but in, a spa in its spatial relation to each other. So you'd have a spatial net, if you like, so you could look at the associative links, and you could look at things that were spatially based on their closeness in functionality, or logic, or uh, their closeness in their physical location to each other. Yeah? But nothing really has moved us into this kind of... Um, consumer space that's not to do with that's not to do with business or or general tasks that I'm that I'm aware of really. Um, the only other thing that I saw was I think I explained this to you uh, a, a guy who was using real world objects but with our but with um, RFID tags on them to represent um, to represent functionality if you like. So therefore he wanted to say he wanted to move the sounds from one speaker to the other speaker so he went and got a pair of tongs which had an RFID tag. He uh, put the tongs, closed them near the actual speaker, took them to another speaker where there was an RFID receiver, let them go and cut it and, and, and then the sound came out of this other speaker. So that was good for his mum who was night uh, was was eighty she was, she was Japanese and uh, she didn't know how to move the sounds around from, this, from, from her TV system to different rooms um, and to different uh, speakers. So this was the way that she was used to doing it. Like, you pick a sound up with the tongs and you put it where you think it ought to be. Yeah? There's also some stuff on um, desk interfaces. So they're not actual or table, if you like, interfaces. So it's a table which is all electronic. And then you put items and objects down on them, which might have um, QR codes or bar scanners, and it knows then what things are, so you can interact with them in a virtual environment, which tries to bring virtual and physical together. It's kind of Microsoft Surface, isn't it? If you put a can of Red Bull or something, then it brings all information about Red Bull. And... Yeah, but there's ones that are far more complex and oh, a bit of search engine than that. But, but that kind of thing, but nothing else. Yeah? Okay. Okay, so... Efficiency is for everyone. That's what I really want uh, we want us all to think about. So we could do we could do things like modern thermostat on the right if we wanted to. Whereby you know there's not that many, there's not that much there, you know, we've got a few numbers, grey, blah blah blah. And we've got a whole heap of buttons here which you'd expect allows us to do something, and then a number of different things at the bottom. Okay? 
So that's one thing. But most people, bizarrely, are better or uh, have a better cognitive um, understanding of this thing, which is a smart thermostat by Nest, and it's a little turny thing. So you turn it, and you see the electronic um, temperature ranging up and down. It tells you how long it's going to take to get to a certain range within a certain room, because it's a room thermostat. You get to see other aspects of the program if you do something, if you uh, press it. Okay? You can see that at the moment it's red, so that means it's heating up. It goes blue, it's cooling down. What's the problem with that? Uh, Colour blind people might not be able to tell. Colour blind people might be able to tell. Blind people might not be able to tell for that matter. Well, blind people can't tell on the other one either. No, that's true, they can't. Although, on the other one, if you actually could work out the, sequ the sequence of these push, if somebody had already taught you, or you, could, or you taught yourself what these push things did in certain combinations, you might be able to have some, some way of controlling it, possibly. Okay? But you wouldn't get the feedback, that's true. But here, difficult to know. Okay? Okay. Um, but it's, it is more cognitively efficient for the majority of the population. Um, it also has this um, automatic learning ability. So generally, it learns from you. So when you walk into a room and you turn the temperature up or the temperature down at certain dates at certain times, after a while, it can learn, it can understand which ones, it can understand when to set the time for when you arrive to that room. And um, also, which ones are um, just um, divergent from the pattern so that they don't need to, changes to the algorithm don't need to be made. Yeah. So it's quite a, quite a smart thing to start. So this kind of thing makes it a lot easier for most people to understand because they don't, they don't actually want to see anything. They just want to say, turn the thermostat, it comes to the right level, and then, hey, presto, after a week of this, we understand what you like. Okay? What each individual that has likes and when they like it, so we can do it automatically for you. Okay? So that's, that's where good software engineers have been at work. Because good software engineers, not, usually, not UX people necessarily, you could argue that the UX people in some way have been terrible due to the fact that they've actually not thought about this aspect for disability. So, but the good thing is, I mean, maybe if you were allowed to control this via um, a mobile phone, then you know you're good to go. So because it's your personal gadget. Um, but the software engineers have done great because they've shelved off all of the complexity. Okay. All of the complexity has gone away into, the, into their algorithms. Different to this thing here, where all of the complexity still really sits in your interface. The, the interaction you're having is still going to be complex here, because it's easier for the software engineers. Yeah? But here, it's harder for the software engineers, but they've done it, which means these guys on the left are good. Yeah? And these guys on the right are by the numbers. experience, ergonomics, human factors, well, no, there's no consensus really. I mean, we all have different views, so you have to know all the different views so that when you go into a work environment, you'll know what the hell they're trying to tell you. Yeah? So some people view this as being, think of usability as software specialisation of the large topic of ergonomics. Okay, so ergonomics, we're thinking about you know, desks, desktops, organisational ergonomics, chairs, um, physical ergonomics. Yeah, that kind of thing. So some people think of this as a specialism of that. Other view topics as, um, as next to it. So with ergonomics focusing on, psycho uh, on um, physiological matters and usability focusing on psychological matters or matters of the interface. Yeah? Level. And there's many experts who've written, written many separate but overlapping frameworks. Okay? To allow us to understand usability better, describe it better, build the principles of usability into our interfaces better. Yeah? It's all about doing this better. But the reality is that the principles are very easy to say, but they're often very difficult to measure. Yeah? So I could say anything. Yeah, pretty much. And, and it's, with, some, with some expertise, you could say pretty much anything you about right. Because it's difficult to measure. 
You don't want to do that. Okay. Now, before we break for coffee, which might be a little bit later today. Yes, a little bit later today. Um, I want you just to just think about this. Universal design and design for all. Has anybody heard of universal design and design for all? Which is a topic which really comes under this more um, efficient interaction. It's kind of part of, um, runs parallel, if you like, to usability. I mean, it's closely linked to, to usability. So, universal design suggests that we create designs which are universally applicable to the most number of people. Okay. But the problem with that is that oftentimes that means that we don't necessarily know the people very well, these, these great these sets of people. We already know from UX that most people are different and that they have different requirements and needs sometimes, even from themselves at different times. So that's difficult. Okay? And universal, universal usability doesn't, doesn't build in much customization and flexibility into the model of them. Okay? So, Mostly, people will say, tell me what you know about universal usability, and you're going to trot out things like, oh, we need to make it so that it's you know, usable by most, by the biggest number of people, we need to think of everybody. These design principles that you're going to see in a minute have been created so that it helps us with this universal design so we can think about everything. But the reality is that what we need to think about, really, is um, the individual. We have to realise that individuals want to change things that individuals are different, they're in different groups, they're different personalities, and what they want to do at different times is different on the same interface. Yeah? How they perceive that interface and come to it is different. So we need to make allowance for those things, which isn't conventionally done in universal usability, because it lumps everybody into one big group. Everybody's the same, so we have to make convention we have to make everything make um, make it we have to give everybody the option. Uh, or the biggest group we possibly can the option of change. And what, we, what the reality is that openness, as we spoke about before, is, is probably the most important part because then we can modify it as we desire. Okay? If the universal usability, usability really existed, then we wouldn't need this accessibility thing because it would already be universal. Yeah? We wouldn't need um, makers who are making little left and right signs because we could already get that because it's universal. So it can't be universal, it's got to be quite personal, I think, anyway. Um, so, this is, this, is, this, is, this is the quote that you'll get as well. Uh, universal usability is more function of keeping all of the people and all of the situations in mind. That's true. It's try to create a product that is flexible, but also commercially practical. It doesn't say anything about openness. It doesn't say anything about the possibility of extension. Yeah. Okay, so my unconventional view on this, and I've written a few papers not the bottom, um, about this. Is there a design for all? No, it's designed for one. Yeah. Yeah. Because you've got that openness, that customizability in there. So, I try to address all the user needs we're apt to address none of them. Yeah, it's just too, the granularity is too big, <coughs> in my opinion. It's not just about utilitarian view of the software, but it's about the personal choices of the users. Okay, so I don't know what the personal choices of the users are going to be if I'm going to build this software. It's not just so utilitarian as that. Great flexibility and configurability of both interfaces and contractions are the solution, in my opinion. And an example in the real world is the... So, Carl Messinger, Messinger in, 18, in the end, later, in the end of the 1800s, invented something. Any idea what it was? Swiss Army Knife, it was. And the Swiss Army Knife was a solution, the practical solution for everybody. <coughs> One knife does all jobs. One knife does all jobs. So how likely, how true do you think that is now? No. How many Swiss Army Knives do we think there are? Hmm? Lots. lots. How big is lots? Bigger than that. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> lots. Well? Do you mean as in like actual number of Swiss Army knives or different types of Swiss Army knives? Okay, the different, the different types of Swiss Army knives and the combinations of those Swiss Army knives. Like a million. Huh? A million. There's not a million. <laughs> but there's a lot. It's about 158. Okay. You can get it. That's bad. Um, so there's loads, there's loads and loads that you can 
now get from different manufacturers, different blah blah blah. Okay, because non non fit every you know this one purpose. Everybody's got different purposes. Okay, I know people who've got three suits on now just because they don't all fit the same purpose. Yeah. Okay. So openness, allowing us to make things ourselves, configure things to our needs. That's the key. Yes. Well, with openness, aren't most commercial applications and companies not going to want to adhere to that principle? Because obviously, a lot of their stuff is proprietary. Um, or is it just you're talking about it on the, the user customization level? Obviously, in the application level, they're not going to want it to be open for the very reason that they've got competition, but they're going to want to sell the new products. Yeah, because people want to make them also better than that. True. But if, you don't want, if they don't want to make it open, an openness within the API, within the interface itself, then that is something that is very easy to do. Right? I mean, you can, I can name you hundreds and hundreds of companies um, that have open APIs, Twitter, Facebook, all these ones. They're all commercial co organizations, but you can't get directly to their information, but you can interact with that via these open APIs. So that's one way of doing it. The other way is that, and, that, and that's a perfectly good, reasonable way for our purposes of talking about openness. Oh, the openness of the API and the interfaces. Yeah? Yeah. Are we talking about uh, interfaces as in sort of box standard operating system we get as well? Because uh, even in the map, which is highly customizable, it, there's still there's certain ways certain thing happens. Yeah. Like same with the Microsoft. And then you think, oh, but I'd like to have it this way. So, yeah. yeah, so therefore you want to be able to get to the, to the system to actually make it, to configure it how you want to. And that, sort of can be, and that can be often difficult. Okay, because of this proprietary nature. It depends whether your model, whether the model is you're selling the stuff, or as we know in the open source, you're selling the services and the configurations and all these things. Or maybe you you have a you know the interface better than others, and therefore you're making the products better than others. Like for instance, um, the iPad, the iPad gesture interface, only recent only recently, multi-touch gesture interface, only recently become open, or at least documented. It was open all the time, but it's been documented. Um, now, Mac, Mac say, oh, Apple say, oh, well, we're doing this because uh, we, haven't, we aren't quite sure yet. They're not doing it. They just, they just want to have a year's worth of messing around with their specific gestures so that, it, so that and others can't at that point. And then they decide, well, we need to make it open, we need to document it. Okay? So that's, one of the, that, that's, that's another um, aspect where openness comes in, but it's staged openness, if you like, so that they, you get... You get your commercial advantage for a year, but then you get the other benefits of being open, which is that more people use your stuff. The reason why, why did Windows become so popular? It's better to sell lots of cheap things than very few, very expensive things, so the price came into it. The price came into it because it, in, back in the day, there was no price. The reality is that you could just grab your piece of uh, Windows you could just grab your Windows operating system with no checks about anything, bang it on your computer. You couldn't do that with a Mac. You had to have a Mac, and you wouldn't say the operating system separately directly. So, you had a problem. Whereas that's not the case for, say, um, for the Windows. So therefore, Windows, they said, oh, you should pay us 50 quid, say, for the operating system. But the reality is nobody did. They just had lots of counterfeit copies, if you like. Well, that's why there was a massive groundswell ground in Windows, because it's Get the operating system for nothing. There was no one going to the laptop. No one no, no, no. Yeah? But when it says patents and many things have sort of come into phone uh, with the sort of phone and the tablets currently, it, you know, for this gesture to unlock a screen and there's a five different counter cases going on in Germany and Australia. Yeah, well I mean that's 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 food for lawyers. I don't I mean you know the reality is that you could I mean the reason why um, why uh, Motorola was bought by um, Google. by Google wasn't because they wanted Motorola's technology, because they wanted the paintings, so that they had some some somewhere to go for their Android operating system. But the reality is that people argue about this all the time. You know, you, I think you just have to do what you think's right at the time. Yeah. I mean, GIF is patented. That's why we got you know JPEG. That's why we got PNG because it's not. Okay. Oh dear, we're going to have to go for coffee. Coffee! Be back in, be back at ten past, okay? So, uh, yeah, go for coffee. We'll start on this afterwards.